Welcome to Fat Logic, where if you ask for a small piece of cake, you're considered to be the devil. Fat activists often claim that nobody's glorifying obesity, such as in this Instagram post. Glorifying obesity is not a thing. No body positive person, body activist, or fat liberationist is ever going to tell you that their life is better than yours because they are fat. Keeping that in mind, let's look at this other post. This was originally brought to us by Suspicious Youth. It looks like this was originally posted in Instagram. There is pleasure in fatness. Glorify it. This reminds me of when people on one side of a political party completely ignore all the bad things that their side is doing and say that the other side is pure evil. I wish I could say humanity had outgrown this phase, but it seems to be going as strong as ever. They continue in their glorifying of obesity. Warmth, big hugs, laughter, connection, delicious foods, buoyancy in the water. That might be the only one of those that actually is better if you're obese. They continue, curves, rolls, dancing, and the list goes on. It can be hard to be fat in this world, there's no denying that, and there can also be so much pleasure in it. Enjoying a delicious meal without being consumed by thoughts about dieting, taking up all the space, the soft and squishy feeling of touching the fat on your body, living life without apology, breaking the rules, having a voice, the joy of fat community, the art of stretch marks. I didn't know what they're talking about. Are they imagining that for some people their stretch marks form like a gigantic phoenix on their back? Like some kind of magical tattoo that naturally forms? They continue, the feeling of being in water and how it makes room for your fat body. The water makes room for anybody when they're in it. Did they not know that? They continue, all the fear mongering about fatness tells a story that is absent of joy, absent of pleasure. What I get from those sentences is that the only pleasure they get is from eating things like cake, and that without cake their life would be joyless. What a sad thing to say that is. This whole ridiculousness about glorifying osity existing in a fat body is not glorification. Do they not remember how they just spent the last two minutes writing about how glorious being obese is? Is something destroying their short-term memory? They continue, but I don't think it's actually glorifying obesity that they're afraid of. I think it's seeing all the pleasure in fatness. Again, they seem to think that pleasure only comes from food. They continue, I think it's confronting the misery of a lifetime spent trying to be small and realizing it doesn't have to be that way. Anti-fat bias doesn't want us to have pleasure. Vita supremaxi doesn't want us to have pleasure. Claim it anyway. Glorify it every darn day. Let fatness be your guide to pleasure and joy and liberation. Live Barracuda replies, No one told me that I, a thin, was not enjoying the feeling of being in my pool, nor was I not to enjoy dancing. My spouse will be devastated that we paid to put a pool in for nothing. I weep my skinny, calorie-obsessed tears here on the patio. And the next person shows us how to struggle uselessly. Ishimura Huntress brings us. The games on the Wii Fit Plus are incredibly fun, but I really hate the anti-fat, BMI-obsessed aspects of it. It classified me on the high end of at risk of becoming overweight, so I set my fitness goal as gaining exactly enough weight to put me in the overweight category. Now it'll have to encourage me to do what it's designed to prevent. Fudge you, we fit. I've never seen somebody get so angry at their own purchases that they bought themselves. Why did they buy a fitness game if they don't want to get fit? Seriously, who's forcing this on them? Jewish Space Medbeds replies, F.A. I'll set up my game council to pat my butt when I stuff my face to gain weight. That'll show them. Nintendo shrugs. I got your money. Posh Monster replies to, I started my weight loss journey out of spite. I suppose someone could start a weight gain journey out of spite, too. But to smite the software they willingly paid for? Brah! The next section's about polar bears. Imagining chemistry brings us weighty matters. Should you gain weight if you want to swim a long distance, cold water, swim? 
in our fat phobic society, in which everyone with even the slightest bit of extraneous adiposity is potentially subject to ridicule, choosing to gain weight can be a difficult decision. But that's exactly what some marathon swimmers do when they're training for long distance cold water swims such as the English Channel. Congratulations, author of this article. You've managed to find an obscure use for something that will affect almost nobody. Amazing. Needs more book, eh? Replies. Thing is, swimmers and other high-level athletes who are exposed to cold weather do have adipose tissue, but in the shape of brown fat. I don't know if that's true or not, but let's keep reading. Brown fat differentiates from regular or white fat for its superior insulating capacity as it can actively burn itself to generate extra heat without the need of shivers. This has zero, absolutely zero, to do with the ridiculous idea of being a better swimmer because you're fat. Best way to create brown fat on your body? Train and expose yourself to cold, cold showers, ice water, be less covered in cold weather, and so on. It's important to know the difference between things. That way you don't buy a bag of tangerines and expect them to taste exactly like oranges. Would an airport brings us someone who believes quite the opposite. Perceived value judgments may make it harder to convey positive messaging about meals and eating habits. Instead of saying junk food, say food. Instead of saying whole food, say food. Instead of saying ultra-processed food, say food. Instead of saying superfood, say food. Instead of saying good slash bad food, say food. Somebody replies, we should add clean food to the list. You know, not being able to distinguish things is a really bad and dumb idea. You might find yourself holding a stick of dynamite when what you really meant to be holding was a candle. Let's not get rid of the distinctions, please. Illustrious Agent replies, I'm not interested in conveying positive messages about junk food. It's garbage. Secret Fudge, yeah, I'm good. The junk food industry doesn't need me to help promote it. They do fine on their own. Do you remember back in the 60s when pretty much everybody on the beach was thin? May brings us. Moms were skinny back then because they were starving themselves. A healthy grown woman, except for certain conditions, etc., of course, should not be the size of a child. Every woman who feels shame at not being small as your mother was, you are completely and utterly beautiful and you can wear whatever dress you want. Heart. That's quite a fine example of sour grapes. One sane person replies, What are you talking about? A size 4 is not the size of a child. That's like the bottom end of a normal weight for someone who isn't super tall. Less so for short women. We can criticize culture for shaming people's bodies without lying, you know? And then more people add their own version of distorting facts. Sorry you grew up on a diet of microwavable war rations and cocaine, mom. Someone else yeah, and you were doing coke and smoking cigarettes for breakfast in the 80s, Sharon. Now be quiet while I pin this hem. I was a size 4 when I got married. Yes, Mary, Elizabeth, Susan, Lisa, Stephanie, because most of your parents had you working at 14, borderline starved you to look good for your future husband, and most of you got married before 25, and you all would say toxic stuff like, I'm pregnant, I can eat whatever I want, smile, and just basic sliced bread was included. That everything. <laughs> We're not even talking about baguettes or brioche. After the babies, you blew up. You want to know why? Because your body was starving for 20 plus years. Somebody comes in to argue, Nah, I'm 105 and 24. Just because you all ain't doesn't mean others weren't and aren't. Somebody in blue, Good for you. Nobody asked. Do they not understand how forums and stuff work where people are allowed to post whatever they want with out being asked for their opinion? I guess not. The skinny person replies again. I'm just saying, y'all look dumb as fudge screaming, no one is that weight unless they're an anorexic baby. Someone else, right, my friend is teetering on 100 pounds and she's 19. She's not anorexic, she's just got a tiny frame and food doesn't stick to her insides as much when she eats. Ha ha ha. I swear that girl used to empty our cabinets of snacks, and she only made it to 102 pounds when she lived with me. The person in blue comes back. Again, some thoughts need to be kept in your head. 
the skinny person comes back. Funny how hating skinny people is cool and nobody asked is your dumb response to someone calling out others pointless hatred. Or maybe learn how to accept the fact that despite your distaste for it, skinny people exist in a healthy manner. Another skinny person. It's amazing how they feel the need to infantilize us to make their point that they shouldn't be body shamed. I'm 4 foot 9, 90 pounds, and 24 years old. I'm not a gosh darn child just because I'm small. Of course they shouldn't feel any shame for the size that they are, whatever that size is. But the fact that so many mid to plus sized women take such joy from obsessively pooping on small women and calling us anorexic children is just cruel. Hey Zeus, at least I didn't need to point at other people's bodies and say, thank goodness I don't look like that because I'm a real woman. It's cringy AF. Someone else writes, Not to mention that science has found that our genes remember things like constant starvation throughout our parents' lives and can't tell the difference between dieting and famine so they adapt and make it easier for the next generation to hold on to fat as a safeguard. Yeah, you've got some ideas there that have some vague evidence to support them, but you need to actually prove that that happens, not just use that as an excuse why people are constantly getting fatter every year. Euphoric Basil Tree replies, People don't seem to have a very good grasp on what things were really like in the 80s or 90s. It was absolutely normal to be thin. It was not requiring everyone to suffer and starve and take drugs to achieve. And, oddly enough, those of us who were extra, extra thin were mocked for being too skinny, on drugs, anorexic, even then. Gertrude Reflection adds, There's a TV series the BBC did a few years ago where they took a family and set them up in a house rejigging it every week to reflect a different decade. They'd live as though they were a typical family in the 1890s, 1900s, 1910, and ending in 2000. Main focus was food, hence it was called Back in Time for Tea. I've never seen this show, but it sounds interesting. What stood out was that up until 1970, 1980, obtaining, prepping, and cooking food was a labor-intensive and a pain in the butt for them. In one episode, they take most of a day to make a small tub of ice cream. Using ice, they had to faff around with prepping it first, then a hand-crank wooden contraption. Oh yeah, I've seen those. Even as old as I am, we didn't use those as a kid. They were mechanical by then. In another episode, they say to kids that they're getting an authentic WW2 treat, and the excited kids are presented with raw carrots. Thing is, the kids were actually stoked about it, as they'd not had refined sugar for weeks, so the natural sweetness did it for them. The gist of it was that you tend to be normal-sized if feeding yourself takes a bit of effort. Not starvation, not speed, or all that histrionic fat acceptance stuff. It's the difference between fancying some ice cream and having some within arm's reach in an electric freezer, or the prospect of having to spend the next seven hours slogging your guts out in the back garden with a wooden bucket, milk, a hand crank, and a solid block of ice. The, meh, forget it, decision is much easier when convenience isn't part of the process. The easiest way to sort of replicate it, if you have weight to lose, is to only have stuff in the kitchen that requires effort to make from scratch. You know how, like, most reasonable diets recommend healthy portions? Well, let's look at what Mad Queer Out brings us. A TikTok creator removed a video in which she said portion control when talking about a budget-friendly meal plan. Some sane person replies, Please don't fall for fat acceptance propaganda. Binge eating and obesity are major issues in America and we need to learn portion control. Someone replies to them, Speak for yourself only, missy. Someone else, as an enormous person, yes. This is a term we need to learn and be comfortable with. Someone else, portion control is neutral. You can have a big or small portion and people can decide that for themselves. It's wild she deleted a video about this. Nothing to apologize for. Portion control is what can help America's obesity problem. A person who from now on we'll call green replies, That is false. Pink replies to them, No, it's not. Green, it is. Pink, it isn't. Green, Obesity is a symptom, not a disease. Portion has nothing to do with anything related to it. Pink, a symptom of overeating. Yes. Green, you have no idea what you're talking about, and this is exactly why she's an amazing, understanding person, and you're a jerk. Pink, I'm obese, overweight myself. I know what I'm talking about. Green, 
Oh, well then, that must mean you know everything then. Come back when you have actual evidence. Pink, she's doing it because of people like you in cancel culture. Green is the kind of person who looks at a bunch of pigs and thinks that they're horses. They somehow think that the amount and kind of food you intake has nothing to do with your weight. I don't know what they're basing that on. Real life CSI guy replies, If Green is so offended by the term portion control, they must have such a hard time buying food seeing as the words serving size are on every package. Secret Fudge replies by censoring the word serving size. Getting constantly triggered by innocent phrases would normally be a wake-up call for most folks, but then again, most folks aren't obsessed with one aspect of themselves, nor do they feel entitled to having the whole world be their safe space. Do you know how kids know absolutely everything and adults are stupid? This post comes to us from Dorkita. My almost four-year-old just said, My body is asking for a drink and my heart says it wants milk. And this is what we mean when we say kids are natural, intuitive eaters. Someone replies, Can you please recommend books to teach kids intuitive eating in HAES for as young as age one, before they can talk? Someone else, kids are naturally intuitive eaters. You don't need to teach them, just trust them. Someone else, yes, this is correct. Kids are naturally intuitive eaters. You don't need to teach, and certainly not a one-year-old. The child only knows to react, maybe crying, maybe some other sign, when hungry, but can't feed themselves, counting on you to get them food. We need to take our examples from a one-year-old. Wait a second, are they suggesting that we should all have parents that feed us? using little tiny rubberized spoons? Because while that might be nice for a day or two, it would get old real fast. Someone else replies, I'm not talking about teaching them, I'm talking about fostering it so they can keep being intuitive eaters into later childhood and adulthood. I guess I'm asking in the wrong group, because I have seen other groups that talk about ways to help your kids to foster intuitive eating, seeing all foods as equal, and body positivity. Righteous Goat Butter replies, Ah, you mean indoctrination. Also, all foods are not equal. At all. There is such a lack of understanding about how nutrition works here. Lego Fan also replies, When my nephew was aged two, he loved to climb the sofa. If left to his own devices, he'd have wanted to climb up the back and throw himself off doing jumpies. He hadn't any sense of danger, which is funny looking back as now at age five, he's quite an overthinker and cautious. F.A. Logic would have us thinking he was an intuitive flyer. Kids do not innately know what is best for them. They navigate the world intuitively through impulse and testing the environment and people around them. Anyone who's ever had or seen a small child can agree that they need to be continually watched, as even the most innocent of said environs can quickly turn harmful to small beings with a seeming death wish. Cat of the Night replies, my ex's kids spent their formative years in a household where food was withheld as punishment and locks were on the cupboard and fridge doors. Their bio parents sold their food stamps for drug money, so there was never enough food in the house. They were malnourished and undersized when we got them. My son needed years of therapy for all kinds of trauma, including food insecurity. He had to relearn how to eat properly. For years he would hide food and stuff himself because he was terrified of being hungry again. I can't count the number of times I'd have to hold him and comfort him while he cried and tantrumed at being told, you don't need a snack right now, you had one two hours ago, and dinner is cooking and will be ready in 15 minutes. Yes, you're going to eat dinner soon. It's okay to feel a little hungry, discomfort, deep breath, and center. If I'd allowed my kids to eat intuitively, it would not have gone well for them with their history. As their parent, it was my responsibility to teach them healthy eating, which I did with their therapist and pediatrician. But I suppose these people would have had me simply fling open the pantry doors and tell my boy, All yours, eat whatever you want, as much as you want. Tiny Still brings us a related one. When you say you've had enough sweets for today, they learn I'm bad for wanting more sweets. I can't trust my body to tell me how much is enough to eat. I should let other people decide how much I am allowed to eat. Ace of Black replies, It's hilarious because I actually read about a study in biology that basically demonstrated that as long as sugary treats weren't present, toddlers could self-regulate their food intake to properly meet their nutritional requirements. Think buffet-style meals with periodic blood testing. As soon as they threw in sugary desserts and candy, the toddlers gorged themselves on sugar until they were sick. 
In other words, the original OP's post is half correct. You quite literally cannot trust your body to tell you when you've had enough sugar. You know how everybody online thinks they're incredibly muscular? This was brought to us by Anxious Emo Natural Science. The BMI is outdated. The medical world is built off of outdated practices and needs to be updated. We have the knowledge and technology to make things better, but we just don't because it's easier to diagnose someone with being overweight than actually try to help them. Someone replies to them, I've got dense as fudge bones and tons of muscle mass. According to my BMI, I should be dead. <laughs> I'm the first to admit I'm overweight, but certainly not morbidly so. I'm five foot nine and I weigh 260 pounds. And I don't look at all like I weigh that much. Also, to be honest, I prefer people some meat on their bones. Lol. Someone else replies, BMI was created for weaklings, not an ounce of muscle. <laughs> Ghosty replies, yeah, and here I am mindfully building muscle and discovering that it really is not something you can do by accident, especially if you're a woman. I'm probably stronger than 90% of those strong fat activists, and guess what? I'm at a healthy BMI. I'm also half the strength of my husband who only rides a bicycle and carries heavy stuff all day. Biology is a harsh mistress. Cernic also replies, there's actually a rare genetic disorder that leads to super dense bones. People with it have near indestructible bones, but also health complications. They also can't swim very well because they literally just sink. It only affects a few thousand people worldwide, so odds are it isn't this person. Or as doctors say, when you hear hoof beats behind you, don't expect to see a zebra. Which I guess is a version of Occam's razor, where the simplest explanation is most often the correct one. Sometimes personal trainers seem to think that they're psychotherapists. Quangsta brings us, Things I've learned as a registered dietitian that have made people on the internet mad, part two. There's no such thing as food addiction. If you feel out of control with food, you likely have a disordered relationship with it. So all those science articles I've been reading recently about how food addiction might be real, that's just BS? Interesting. She knows more than a whole bunch of scientists. She must be very wise. To feel more in control around food, we need to stop restricting it. We must give ourselves unconditional permission to eat. And it shows a picture of her eating what looks to be a muffin. Isn't this almost word for word the wording of the people who were paid by the sugar industry? to say positive things about sugar, that we should just eat more of it to make ourselves more comfortable around sugar, when in fact that doesn't happen at all. The more sugar we eat, the more sugar we crave in reality. Emotional eating isn't bad, it's something we should experience. It's when we cope with negative emotions through food or use food to numb out that needs attention healing. She needs to try to remember that she's a registered dietitian, not a psychotherapist. No one needs the keto diet unless you're a child with epilepsy. See, that just seems ignorant to me. A lot of people do perfectly fine on the keto diet, even if they don't have epilepsy and it doesn't affect them in a bad way. Some people prefer not to do the keto diet, and that's fine too. She feels to me like one of those people who's an angry, talking head on a 24-hour news network who's always saying things just to get a reaction and keep the viewer tuned in. It's not that she has anything interesting to say. She's just being obnoxious on purpose. The next one, Whole30 won't solve your gut health issues. It will likely destroy your relationship with food and make your gut issues worse. I've never heard anybody before this moment complain about Whole30. Ever. This blows my mind. If I had any respect for this person, I might look into why Whole30 was bad, but I don't. They continue, there's more to weight than nutrition, exercise, and discipline. Factors like genetic modifications, food access, healthcare access, trauma, weight stigma can impact weight. You can't assume someone's health status just by looking at them. I don't know what the message is supposed to be there, because in the background of that message is her hanging out with another skinny white woman. Both of them look like to be in pretty good shape. So in what way does the picture 
in any way enhance the words? Or is this just more like one of those influencers who throws up pretty pictures and then throws up words that are supposed to inspire you in front of it that have nothing at all to do with the picture? Just as a way to spice up their rather boring Instagram account. The next one, doing HIT five days a week is not helping your gut or hormone issues. It may be one of the root causes of your imbalance. I don't know about all that, but doing HIT five days a week will take a toll on your body and probably make you very sore a lot and pretty soon make you want to give up. I think the usual recommendation is to only do HIT one or two days a week at most. The next one, bloating doesn't always mean you have a big gut health issue. First try eating enough, not skipping meals, slowing down when you eat, and chewing until the texture is like applesauce, and see what happens. I don't know where she's going with that, but maybe some of that advice might help. And then she ends it with, if you need help healing your relationship with food. Again, she's a registered dietitian, not a therapist, so she can't help anyone with their relationship with food. Take my quiz to see if my Better Together program is for you. Our next class starts November 6th. Emoji, emoji. She's just trying to help, guys. Now give her money and sign up for her classes. I promise she doesn't just want your money. I had to see a dietitian as part of an outpatient eating disorders treatment team years and years ago. Dude actually said to me at one point, I'm here for the boring practical stuff. You need to talk to the doctor, the shrink, about emotional stuff. Like, he'd give me my eating plan for the week, and if I wanted to have a panic attack over it, I had to take that noise next door. So yeah, I always get twitchy when I see these types of things, as, as far as I know, nutritionists and dietitians are not qualified to assess, diagnose, or treat eating disorders, at least not independent of other healthcare providers. That's how you end up with 500-pound models claiming to be diagnosed with anorexia nervosa, after one Zoom call with an Instagram grifter. Professional Hat also replies, Emotional eating is one of those things I think can be unhealthy, but acceptable in moderation. Like, if you go down to the pub with your mates for a pint after a bad breakup, fine. But if you start drinking every night to fill the pain of said breakup, not fine. A couple nights spent binging rom-coms and eating ice cream straight from the tub probably count as emotional eating, but not particularly problematic behavior. You know how some people online are always trying to trick you? Dorkita brings us four reasons to ditch the low carb diet for blood sugar management. Increases insulin resistance. When carbs are cut or decreased in the diet, fat intake increases. That high fat diet increases insulin resistance. In the beginning of starting a low carb diet, the sugar may decrease, but over time, insulin resistance will kick in and the blood sugar will rise. I spent a while searching on Google Scholar for anything agreeing with her and couldn't find anything at all. Now, it might still exist, but I'm very skeptical. And I feel like she just made that up or misunderstood something. The next thing she writes is, increases gluconeogenesis. Gluconeogenesis is a fancy word that means the body, mostly liver, will make glucose when there is none in the diet. Have you ever wondered why your blood sugar is high in the morning? Before eating anything? That's because of gluconeogenesis. That's not an argument against a low-carb diet. That's just pointing out that your body's able to make its own sugar. At least in limited quantities. The next one increases neuropeptide Y. Neuropeptide Y is a peptide that is released into our brains that drives our urge to eat sugary foods. It's increased when there are little to no carbohydrates in the diet. This often leads to overeating, especially late in the day. This is a rather strange thing to write about the keto diet. Most people on the keto diet, while they may not enjoy the diet particularly, often find that after two or three days, their hunger levels are very low and they're not craving sweet things at all. I'd like to see her basis for how keto diets are causing people to be hungrier for sweet foods, because I've never seen any research that supports that. And her last one, carbs are tasty. Don't start a diet you can't follow forever. Don't cut out your favorite foods when you don't have to. I kind of agree with that and kind of don't. This is supposed to be an argument about why it's bad to do the keto diet. This doesn't make the keto diet bad. It makes a more moderate diet perhaps better. 
But if the message is carbs are tasty, that makes it sound like you're also promoting eating a high sugar diet because that also is tasty. But that isn't really a healthy diet, is it? Real life CSI guy replies, they were doing so well with science sounding reasons and then ran out by the end to flounder with, uh, tasty food. Who need willpower when cram bread in mouth? Mmm, carb. Really just took any wind out of their argument. Book Hermit replies to all of them. About the insulin resistance increasing. Citation needed. If you replace carbs with fats and continue to eat a high calorie diet and snack all day long, you will continue to gain weight and your cells will be desensitized to the frequent flood of insulin. Eating a low carb diet means ditching all the sweet, fat, salt, junk foods people are addicted to snacking on and give cells a break from insulin so they have a chance to become sensitized again. About the body being able to make its own sugar. So, the liver can make its own sugar. That means your body doesn't require you to eat any to survive. About craving sweets. Diet changes are difficult and require an adjustment period. Feeling hungry or having cravings is not an emergency that requires one to overeat. You have agency. And about the message, carbs are tasty. Low carb doesn't mean zero carb. You can eat some starches and sugars and grains every day if you like, in moderation. Not as much as you want as often as you want. You can't keep overeating these foods at the same clip that got you sick in the first place. Hey, do you know how chocolate milk's tasty? Not Jessica brings us. My four and a half year old only drinks chocolate milk, maybe 36 ounces a day. We make it with skim and light on the syrup, but she refuses alternatives like chocolate and sure or a banana blended into chocolate milk. We offer her so many foods to try to find something she will eat. She will eat candy, ice cream, cookies, cakes, potato chips, cinnamon toast crunch cereal, pineapple, strawberry, and pizza. But she'll only eat like one of these real foods, fruit or pizza or sugar cereal, like once per day. We would make her pizza for every meal, but she will only take bites. The rest of the day she is whining, moaning, screaming, and making threats for chocolate milk. I'm trying to embrace anti-dieting family life and division of responsibility. My partner believes in healthy versus unhealthy foods. We agree that it's our job to make sure she gets a variety of food choices, and she's honestly a hangry beast all day long. I think the milk fills her and prevents hunger for other foods that could help her feel well. I hate being the arbiter of how much chocolate milk she's allowed to drink, and we will have so many fights over what solid food she has to eat before we will get her her fourth or fifth cup of milk. This is everything I want to avoid with anti-diet and DOR. We try to be neutral about foods, but it feels unacceptable to serve a a four-and-a-half-year-old child predominantly milk for weeks at a time. Her behavior is ornery, resistant, rude, demanding, probably super hungry. I hate the feeling of restriction, and for me it breeds intense desire, but do we need to detox from the chocolate milk for her to be open to solid food? This seems super anti-anti-diet, right? Or just yes to all chocolate milk and trust her body to know what it needs. We believe she is neurotypical, but should our approach be different while we explore if she is neurodivergent? My other child eats normally picky toddler food, but chooses among a variety of options. Totally easy to feed compared to my four and a half. I really don't want her to develop disordered eating from either a restricted diet or all the discussion and cajoling from us to eat solid food. The teenage version of this food drama will be a nightmare, and I'd rather just let her have all the milk she wants so we don't develop patterns about disagreeing over food. But man, is she dysregulated all the time. We think she needs important nutrients. She refuses vitamins and supplements, same as food. Thanks for any suggestions. Step one, go to the doctor. You need to talk to the doctor about what your child is going through. Don't try to go through it alone or... Worse, asking randos on the internet for advice about taking care of your children. I don't know what has led you to believe that people on the internet are good sources of information about how to take care of a child. Second, it probably sounds like your child either has some kind of sensory issues or they are neurodivergent. In either case, who should you talk to? A, the internet, or B, a doctor? That's right, your doctor. In fact, every single one of your questions should not be answered by the internet, but should be answered by your doctor. So go and talk to them already. 
You guys know what whataboutism is? It's when you don't have a good answer and change the subject by pointing fingers at someone or something else. Vivid Possibility brings us, despite repeatedly stating that obesity is associated with other health problems, the guidelines echo years of fear-mongering public health campaigns with strong statements implying that obesity causes disease. When I trace these claims to their cited research studies and to some studies cited by those studies, I found a string of unsupported opinions, associations, and assumptions that if fat people are more likely to say, develop high blood pressure, it's because they are fat. How then to explain thin people who get high blood pressure? Yeah, that's a good whataboutism. Let's look at the real facts. A thin person is much less likely to get high blood pressure than somebody who's obese. Suggesting it's either the high blood pressure causing obesity, or obesity causing high blood pressure. Which one do you think it is? They should be honest with themselves for a second and stop trying to deflect. It's clearly the obesity causing the high blood pressure in most cases. Reverse Lazarus writes, I lost 80 pounds and got off my blood pressure meds. Everything else I tried to lower my blood pressure when I was obese failed. Then, poof, when the weight came off, the blood pressure came down. Stuff like this makes me so sad. So many human beings buying into this stuff are risking their lives because of some of the deepest denial in existence. Regretful creature, I went from almost 200 pounds to 140. I can honestly say I feel better both mentally and physically without the 60 pounds of extra weight. I breathe better, I'm lighter on my feet, I don't get heartburn anymore, and can actually keep up with the kids at work. I also just feel more confident and happy in my body despite still needing to lose about 10 more pounds. You know how some people think doctors are dumb? Hefty Dig brings us. Doctors who prescribe weight loss as a solution to literally anything when every single study since 1950 tells us long-term weight loss is impossible for nearly everyone are so lazy. Oh yes, if I had a completely different body, you wouldn't be having this problem. That's the equivalent of me going in for a rash on my arm and being told, oh well, you see, if you just didn't have an arm there, then this issue wouldn't have happened in the first place. No, it's more like if you just hadn't rubbed your arm on some poison ivy, you wouldn't have this issue. That's why I stopped letting medical professionals weigh me unnecessarily, which is pretty much every single time they ask. They can see I'm fat already. There's no reason to give them extra reasons to be bad at their job and give lazy, pointless, and useless advice. Sacred Reputation replies, When I was a smoker and had repeated bronchitis and walking pneumonia, doctors told me that quitting smoking would help prevent it. The nerve of them. Don't they know how hard it is to quit smoking? Treat me like a normal person who doesn't smoke. This one's for tossing also replies. I've only ever had doctors tell me, even at my heaviest weight and being 36% body fat, that losing weight would help to improve whatever issues I was facing in terms of the care they were able to provide. It's not exactly a shocker that when I'm talking to a doctor about my breathing issues, they are going to tell me that losing weight and more cardiovascular activity would certainly help to improve the spectrum of my asthma care. You know how important a good program and schedule can be sometimes and make the real difference between success and failure? Crafty Table brings us. Anything that starts with dieting doesn't work, so you have to lose weight through sensible eating habits instead is just BS. The only logically consistent follow-up to weight loss dieting doesn't work is, so any approach to being healthier should take a weight-neutral approach. Dieting by any different name is still dieting. Your body doesn't care what you call it. If you are altering how you eat, calorie restriction, cutting out foods, adjusting the balance of what types of food you eat, changing what you eat with the goal of losing weight, that is a diet. Celtic Guardian replies, In other words, there is nothing you can do to improve your life. Give up, accept your fate, roll over, and die. What a pathetic worldview to subscribe to. You know how some people don't understand science at all? No rhubarb brings us. Let's talk about fat phobia in psychology. So I'm a psychology student, and I was disgusted today to find out about fat phobia still a part of modern day psychology. The waist to hip ratio is still a legitimately accepted theory behind the biological explanation for the attractiveness of women. It says how a slim waist and wider hips are an honest sign of fertility because it shows a woman is not pregnant. This means, according to this, plus-size women are objectively less attractive than skinny women. 
This is blatant reinforcement of fat phobia and trying to find an excuse and legitimize people's narrow-minded views that plus-size women are less attractive than skinny women. This should not be accepted in modern psychology. Psychology should not legitimize such fat phobic views and should instead focus on more legitimate factors and factors people have control over, why people are attracted to each other, such as self-disclosure theory, height, sexual selection, etc. Plus size women should not be discriminated against, and its disgusting psychology tries to reinforce fat phobia as legitimate and an excuse to accept the views of fat phobic men that plus size women are less attractive. This needs to stop. Invisible Space Vamp replies, Dear psychology student, this is not how good science works. Science observes and records these findings. It does not try to change these observations based on a certain belief or political agenda. Of course, these things always had an influence on science, but I wouldn't call the results good science. I mean, especially psychology. It's such a rich history of diagnosing people based on now outdated social norms and stigma. Wouldn't a psychology student be very aware of these past mistakes and be extra careful with adapting an agenda that is currently trendy on social media? And finally, science. This was originally in Parade. Here's who's most at risk for the new type of heart disease researchers have just identified. The name of it is called Cardiovascular Kidney Metabolic Syndrome, or CKM. It's a way to synthesize our understanding of how several factors such as excess adiposity, obesity, high blood pressure, glucose control, kidney disease, and heart disease all interact with each other. So as I understand it, what they're basically saying is that cardiovascular health, kidney health, and metabolic syndrome are all interrelated. So they're creating a disease that kind of connects all three together. Stephen Asantis Foot replies, Fake news! My favorite TikTok philosopher told me that weight stigma is the only aspect of obesity that causes medical harm. Jewish Space Medbeds. It's well known that obesity affects the whole body in all sorts of ways. Wouldn't be surprised to see the same thing for reproductive health, cancer, and autoimmune disorders. Fat is a gland that secretes sex hormones and inflammatory cytokines. You've come to the end of the video. I hope you've enjoyed it. If you did, please consider clicking like and subscribe. If you really liked it, please consider becoming a member. All members get their names shown at the end of the video, as well as members at the top two levels get their names read out. Members at the very highest level get a free video roughly about once every two weeks. Special thanks go out to Emmett McNally, Cupcake or Death, MMC, Just a Girl, that one guy, Wolf Child Rusk, Average Loser, Maria P, Shringa H, Gray Warden Invasion, Rue the Viewer, and Taylor Morris. I wish all of you wonderful people a wonderful day.